turn to Exodus chapter 4, page 91. Our services for today are, is all about the excuses we make as human beings when God calls us to follow him. And we have, I think, one of the, one of the great examples with Moses. And I, and I think there is, although God wasn't happy about it, but for us, there's some humor in this chapter of how Moses responds to God's call. Look at chapter 3 for a moment. Chapter 3, of course, was God's call to Moses on the Mount of the Mount of God, I don't remember the mountain, but it was the Mount of the Burning Bush. Remember that? And there, God reveals his most personal name, the name Yahweh, which means I am that I am. We don't even know how to pronounce that name because it was so sacred to the Jews. But that's where God gives his name, and he says, Moses, I want you to go back and, tell, and lead the folks out of Egypt. Moses, of course, is about how old, Mason? He's older than your father. He's how old? Anybody want to guess? 80. About 80 years old, yes, thank you. 40 years in Egypt and 40 years wandering with Jethro, his father-in-law, his wife Zipporah. They had two boys, and uh, now God calls. Imagine that being, anybody here 80 years old? Bill is. Bill, you're over 80, Bill. So are you, Bill. <laughs> Close enough, huh, Bill? All right, let me read this. Signs for Moses. So Moses answered God, What if they, that is your children Israel, don't believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff. So throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake and he ran from it. The Lord said, Reach out your hand, take it by the tail. So he reached out and took the hold of the stake and it turned back into the staff in his hand. This is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak. When he took it out, it was leprous like snow. Put it back into your cloak. So Moses put it back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. The Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the dry ground. Oh, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go! I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Oh, Lord, please... Please send somebody else to do it. The Lord's anger burned against Moses. What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. His heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if it were your mouth and as if it were God, as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform miraculous signs with it. Now turn to Luke chapter 9. Page 1611. Page 1611, Cost of Following Jesus, verses 57 and following. I'll have you read that in a moment. I'm always amazed by Moses. You know, why didn't God just slap him? <laughs> but what brazen, what, what, what do you call that? Is that brazen? 
to fight God and argue like that? And then to say, why don't you just send somebody else? I wonder how many people have done that in their lives. Lord, I don't want to do what you want me to do. Just use somebody else. Yeah, Jonah was another good example of that. Anyway, we contrast Moses' attitude to Jesus' attitude. Look at verse 51. Read it for me, please. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Last week the sermon was on divine determination. Similar thing. He resolutely set his face toward Jerusalem for the last Passover and for his passion, death, and resurrection. Major difference between Jesus and Moses. All right, I'm going to have you read. Notice these are three encounters. Notice the threeism. Notice what they have in common. Notice what they have not in common. Go ahead. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds in the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead, dead bury the dead. dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Keep your Bibles open. These three encounters are brought together by Luke. And these three encounters really show the priority of God's call to follow him. You know, in confirmation class, I use the imagery that God, to follow the, the Lord Jesus is our top priority, and everything else falls in underneath that. But God's call and to follow him is first, and everything else then is affected by that in our lives. These three encounters show the priority of God's call in our lives. They, uh, it shows the radical nature of Jesus' challenge to follow him. Now, any of you come from Nordoff today, from Tampa area, drive across the bridge? You did. That's right, you did. You drive over that bridge over the railroad tracks? There's a big sign. United States Marine Corps advertisement. Anybody know what it says? We don't take applications. Only, only commitments. Very good. That's what it is today. God doesn't take applications. He takes and requires commitments of the first priority. Now, let's look at this guy, okay? Here we have a volunteer in verse 57. He says, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. What a dope. He has no idea what he is saying. He sounds like Peter who says, Lord, I will never deny you. I will lay down my life to follow you. And we know how Peter failed miserably. These words come off his lips too easily. He has no idea the cost of following Jesus. It's not simply accompanying him in a journey walking to Jerusalem. He had no idea what lay ahead in Jerusalem. He had no idea what Jesus was going through. He had not counted the cost of discipleship. And imagine, look in your Bibles for a moment in chapter 9, verse 46. Why would you want to join a group of guys who just were arguing about what? Who's the greatest among them? Why would you want to do that? He has no clue what he just said. Now look at verse 58. Verse 58 is an interesting response. It seems to make no sense. Foxes and birds have places, but the Son of Man, God, when he comes, has no place to dwell. Sounds strange. There can be two meanings. I understand that foxes, the word fox was used of foreigners in Jesus' day. Crafty, okay? And birds were used of Gentiles who lived in Israel. 
So the point is that even foreigners and Gentiles have a place in Israel to dwell. But when God comes down from heaven, he's got no place to be. He doesn't fit in. Or it could simply mean foxes and birds, they have places to dwell. And when God comes into Israel, he still has no place to dwell and no place to live. He, because his permanent home is not here, his permanent home is in heaven. Candidate number two. Notice two and three have something in common. What is it? Huh? Well, excuse. There's two words there that they both have. The word... But first. But first, let me do this. The problem with that is there's something of a greater priority. Now, the second guy is strange. He says, I want to go bury my father. Jesus says, ah, you let the dead bury the dead. You come and go proclaim the kingdom of God. What a terrible thing to say. How would you like it? Wouldn't it be terrible if your kids didn't show up for your funeral? Huh? That would be one of the most offensive things. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters? You didn't show up for dad's funeral. In Jesus' day, this was considered the most sacred religious act, was to go to the funeral of a parent. It was more important than obeying the law. Now, Jesus is brazen, and he says, ah, let the dead bury the dead. Now, what does that mean? How can dead people bury their own? They can't. But what he's telling, it may be that, may be, Eddie, but what he's telling him is family is probably the most important thing in our lives. Would you say an amen to that? Amen. Would you say your family is most important to you? Right? We would die for our children. We sacrifice for our children. We love our children. We love our families. For most of us, that is the highest priority. Jesus says, I got news for you. To follow me requires a higher priority than your love for your family. Jesus said elsewhere, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So the second one is this. And the third, family is the highest for most of us. But our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ is higher and more important than that. You know, I wonder how many families in the early church had to make the choice between their children and Jesus when the persecutions came through. I wonder how many of them, we probably, I wonder if there's any evidence of that in the literature, but how many of them said, we're either going to kill your children or you're going to deny worshiping the emperor and de or worship the emperor and deny your allegiance to Jesus. That'd be tough, wouldn't it? Kill my child or be faithful to my Lord. Hope those days never ever come to us in our lives. That's the second one. There's a priority higher. And Jesus doesn't expect us not to go to our parents' funerals. He's using this for shock effect. Okay? That's the point, to get us to realize that allegiance to him is more important. Let's go on to number three. The final man says, I'll follow you, but let me go and say goodbye to my family. But first, let me go and say goodbye. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? What's the problem? The problem is, first of all, there's something more important than following him. And the second thing is, discipleship has no place for hesitation. Discipleship has no place for hesitation. It's like he's saying, yeah, I'll come and follow you. It's important. But I'll, let me do this first, and then I'll catch up to you. I wonder how many people have said that in their lives. Yeah, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me do this first in my life. And what happens? They never get around to following him. Happens a lot. The farming incident is interesting, isn't it, about plowing the field. Any of you guys plow farmers? No? Anyway, the plowing idea is this. He who puts his hand to the plow and then keeps looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. There's two levels here. Number one, he who decides to follow Jesus and follow the God of heaven and earth and then keeps looking back and saying, you know, I wish I could go back to the way life used to be. I wish I could give this following him up and go back 
And we think that quite often, don't we? Maybe you don't, but I do. And wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to go to church, if you didn't have to give your money to support the kingdom of God, if you didn't have to work in his kingdom and be concerned about God's things. You could just do whatever you wanted to do. And there was no higher calling, nothing else. That's putting your hand to the plow and always wanting to go back. I wonder how many millions of Americans that that has happened to. That they came to follow Jesus and they de finally decided, no, you know, I want to go back. I want to go back to the way it was. You know, statistics tell us, folks, that is why it is so hard to come to Jesus as an adult. Bill, you can come in and sit down. That's why it's so hard to come to Jesus as an adult. You know, I think it be, be, from the age of 0 to 10 or 11, you have like a 32% chance of coming to faith. When you get to high school, it drops down to like 4%. And when after the age of 18, guess how high it goes? 9%. So the time to come to the Lord is in those early years. And that is why it's so hard for adults to come to Jesus. Because they like it the old way. They don't want the new way. Because it's not an application, it's a commitment. Now, earlier in this chapter, Jesus said these words. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to, lose his, to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Losing your life, denying yourself, we don't want to do. Because we, have to, we are called to lose our life, which means we have to leave behind, set aside as secondary, what we want in life. And God has to be a top priority. See, none of us want to deny ourselves. We like old Frankie Sinatra's song, which is, I did it. My way. You ever hear of a song, I did it God's way? No, that wouldn't even make it on the charts. Because we don't want that. That's that rugged individualism of Americans, right? We did it my way. I plowed my field. I did what I wanted. And I accomplished what I wanted. I may have made mistakes, but I did it my way. Faith and the call requires you to give up your way and to live life God's way. And we don't want to do that. We want to live life on our terms and live it our way. And the call to faith is to leave behind our way and live the Father's will in our life. And that does not come by nature. It takes an act of God for that to happen in your life and in my life. Jesus must be one's top priority. And everything else then it fits in underneath that. Okay? Jesus, our, our discipleship is not relegated to momentary thoughts. It is where he pervades all of our lives. I think, and I thought a lot about this this week, I think for many of us, if not most of us, our life of discipleship following Jesus fits into what we want life to be, as opposed to life is because of my discipleship. I think most of us live that way. That discipleship, following Jesus, that has to fit into what I want. And now that's, it's comfortable. But God calls us to get out of our comfort zone and to say, listen, I need to be the first priority. I need your commitment. And if you lose your life by giving it up to me, guess what? You will then save it. Here's the gospel for today. Jesus lost his life and gave it up to the Father. He went to the cross. He gave up his life. He left behind his own will and followed the Father's will, okay? Which led to what? His death. 
as the one perfect payment for sin. But his death didn't end in death. What did it end in? Resurrection. So you and I, when we deny ourselves, when we lose our lives, our life doesn't end in death, but it ends in eternal life and the resurrection. Everybody understand that connection? We're following Jesus. He gave up his life in obedience to the Father. That was his top priority. And in his death, he won life for you and me, but his resurrection. And you and I, when we lose our lives in him, we, fought, we don't end in death, we end in life with the Father. Everybody understand that? Losing your life is losing it in him, then you will save it. But hanging on to what you want, to your way, you're gonna end up losing your life in death as the end. Your Father in heaven, we come to you this day and you know our discipleship. You know that for many of us, our lives, we try and fit being your disciples, try to fit following Jesus into what works and what fits for us. Dear Father, remind us of the first commandment. We are to love you, the Lord our God, with all our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind, not just some of it, not just when we have time, not when we get done with other things. And so, dear Lord, today, as we come to the sacrament, empower us through that body and blood to follow you, dear Jesus, as disciples. To be, and let that be the top priority in our lives, the top commitment. In Jesus' name, amen.